Hello, I'm Sachi Inari Rizzo, Curator of Prints and Drawings at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. Every other month, I offer a print talk in the Print and Drawing Studies Center and offer it virtually. For this season of Print Room Talks, we've been going back to the basics of printmaking. In this series, we've been exploring various printmaking processes together, learning technical terms, and hopefully fostering an appreciation and love of prints. I've been using this image for each talk because it outlines the four different categories of printmaking processes that we are covering over the course of the year. In September, we focused on relief prints in which the block material is carved away, leaving the printed surface higher or in relief. The red in the slide represents the ink. In November, we began looking at intaglio, which comes from the Italian word intagliare, in meaning into, and tagliare, to cut. This category has the largest number of techniques. It includes engraving, dry point, mesotint, etching, and aquatint. All cut marks are grooves and channels that are below the surface of the matrix. In the slide, the red ink fills the recessed areas. Each intaglio technique, though, differs in how the artist makes the marks on the matrix. The matrix in this case is usually a thin, thin metal plate. Because there are so many different techniques as seen in Reynard Weidenauer's print, I, cut, I split the processes up into two talks. In November, we looked at intaglio processes where lines are cut directly into the plate without the aid of acid. Today, we'll explore etching and aquatint, the ones that use acid to bite the lines. These are some of the basic materials needed to make an etching. In etching, a metal plate is coated with a thin waxy layer that is resistant to acid called a ground. It is made from asphaltum, beeswax, rosin, and a solvent. As you can see on the right, drawing lines with a pointed etching needle breaks through the ground and reveals the metal. After the drawn area is complete, the plate is immersed in an acid bath, which bites the exposed areas of the plate. This is where the lines have been drawn. The ground protects the undrawn areas from the acid solution. The depth and broadness of the bitten line corresponds with the strength of the acid solution and the length of time the plate has left in. When the plate is ready to print, the ground is removed, the plate is inked and then wiped and run through the press. The deeper, broader, line, the, the deeper, broader lines will hold the ink. The growth of paper mills and the development of the rolling printing press were crucial to the rise of intaglio printmaking. Intaglio prints are not printed by hand. More pressure is needed to transfer the ink to the paper than say in a relief print because the ink is below the surface of the plate. The intaglio printing press consists of a flat bed that moves horizontally from one end to another between two rollers operated by a wheel crank or motor. Presses for relief print printing spread the pressure over a large surface. With an intaglio press, the pressure is concentrated in the area where the plate is in contact with the upper roller. It is likely that the invention developed from a rolling pin sometime in the 15th century. These are photographs of Christopher Gantz, who teaches printmaking at PFW. The ink is rubbed down into the incised lines in the plate and the excess ink is wiped away repeatedly. The plate is placed face up on an intaglio press bed. A dampened sheet of paper is laid on top of the plate, followed by a piece of felt or thin blanket that will distribute the pressure evenly when it's run through the press. Before printing, the top roller is adjusted to accommodate the height of the plate and the pressure is checked. The image on the, on the print will be in reverse of the plate. Surface decoration on armor was the precursor to etching on paper. This is a stunning example of etching on armor in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This etched embellishment is attributed to Daniel Hopfer. Some suggest Hopfer pioneered the technique of making prints from an etched metal plate, which re revolutionized printmaking in the 16th century. He etched onto iron and was successful in producing 145 etchings. This is the time in the print talk when I would ordinarily share a work by German printmaker Albrecht Dürer, as I have in the past two talks. Although Durer and a small group of other contemporaries experimented with etching on iron, only Hoffer and his sons produced significant bodies of work in the medium at this time in etching's history. This is a 17th century etching by Abraham Boss in which two printmakers are at work. The one on the left is etching and the other one working is out working on an engraving on the right. The person etching is able to hold the needle like a pencil 
whereas the engraver holds the burin's knob like a handle in the palm, fingers wrapped on the shaft and guiding the tool while moving the plate around, not the burin. These drawings show cross sections of an etched versus an engraved plate. The burin shaft is lozenge shaped and removes the metal cleanly. The etching needle scratches through the ground to the surface of the plate. The bite of the acid is irregular. As the acid etches deeper, it can slowly etch sideways as it reaches under the ground. These differences translate into the distinctive line quality in the two mediums. This is a comparison between an etching by German artist Emil Nolde on the left and an engraving by Rubens after Rubens by Paulus Pontius. We're going to skip right to a close up so you can see the line work better. The edges of the etched lines are not as clean and crisp as the engraving due to the irregular biting of the acid. The engraved lines look more steady, precise, and swell and taper. Etch lines also tend to have blunt ends and engraved lines are often tapered. Many French painters in the 19th century took day trips outside the city, interested in fleeting changes of light, weather, and atmosphere. Camille Corot was associated with the Barbizon School and began drawing and etching outdoors, taking his copper plate to, to capture naturalistic views of the countryside. Once the ground is cured on the metal plate, the surface is pretty durable, and the only other tool needed is an etching needle, so it is very compact and transportable. An, et an artist can sketch on the plate and finish it in the studio. Many artists at this time were reconsidering etching's potential as a creative art form, launching a renewed interest in the medium. In, in Souvenir d'Italy, the energy of the artist's hand is translated into the flowing etched lines. Etched lines retain freedom of, and spontaneity due to the lack of resistance and ease of drawing through the ground rather than literally cutting through the metal. Corot has lines that range from faint to dark to show distance through atmospheric perspective, where objects in the horizon are lighter, hazy, and indistinct. Objects in the foreground are more clear, crisp, and darker. Corot was able to accomplish this through biting the plate at multiple depths. L. Held's large-scale etching Straits of Magellan with all of its circles and hovering planes is a wonderful print to talk about creating shadow effects and texture through line. As discussed in previous talks, hatching is used to suggest tonal areas through a series of closely sp spaced parallel lines. A second series of lines set at an angle of the, of the first lines is called cross hatching. The eye blends the area. The artist can vary the spacing and thickness of the lines, but the eye basically optically mixes the, these areas so that we see tonal graduate gradations that, that form volumes and suggest a sense of space. Some areas read as nearly black, but if you look closely, you can see that the area is not solid, but is made up of lines. We notice in Kata Kalbus's tragic etching runover that her lines are thick and heavy. She's used a soft ground. Soft ground etching is used when the artist would like the lines, like lines that are more reminiscent of a pencil or a crayon. In this form of etching, tallow or petroleum jelly is added to the acid resistant ground that coats the plate. And the tallow prevents the ground from hardening. The artist makes a drawing on a piece of soft paper that is fixed on top of the ground. As the artist draws the design on the paper, the soft ground adheres to the paper. When the paper is lifted, it removes the ground, leaving the design exposed on the copper plate. Where the artist has pressed harder, more ground is, is removed. Even the tooth of the paper can be impressed into the ground or other textures can be impressed. The plate is then bitten in acid, the ground removed, inked, wiped, and printed. When we look at a close-up of Kalvitz's runover, especially around the hand holding the child, there are areas of vertical lines from the impressed pattern in the paper. Mary Bendolph is a contemporary quilt maker who worked with Paulson Fontaine Press to make this print. At the print making workshop, Bendolph and other quilt makers from G's Ben sewed together small pieces of fabric, like a small abstract study. The piece block was then pressed into the soft brown, which captured all the fine textures and details, especially along the seams. In Frank Brangwen's etching Musician, 
we notice an irregular pitting or dots in the background. This is known as foul biting, which is caused by acid getting through the ground. Perhaps the ground was too thin or the acid too strong. While this may be accidental, some artists may intentionally use it to create tone. In the musician, the foul biting seems to augment that gritty nature of the street scene. During the printing process, the plate is completely covered with ink and then the excess ink is wiped away. The ink remains in the incised areas. The 17th century Dutch artist Rembrandt experimented with his inking for, vari for varied effects in his etchings. Partly because of their admiration for Rembrandt's works, it, is common, it was a common practice for 19th century artists to leave a film of ink on the plate's surface. This would give the print a subtle continuous tone perhaps to emulate changing light or atmosphere. And this is an etching by American artist, James Abbott McNeil Whistler, who is known for his etchings in addition to his paintings. And if you look along the margins of the plate, you will notice the contrast between the color of the paper and the printed image, adding a slight color to the overall image. Hatching and cross hatching are the only means of making a range of values in etching. However, it can be combined with aquatint that makes the continuous tone. Aquatint provides a way to emulate the character of watercolor and diluted ink used as a wash. Aquatint was invented by Jan van de Velde in uh, the, the fourth in Amsterdam around 1650. The name comes from the Latin word aquafortis, meaning strong water, or in this case, nitric acid. The process doesn't actually involve water. The Italian word tinto means tone. Minute particles of acid resistant material, usually made of asphaltum or rosin, are fused to the metal plate through heat. Spreading the aquatint particles evenly over the plate in a thin layer can be accomplished by hand with a dust bag or a dusting box. On the left is Christopher Gantz again. He's preparing the plate with aquatint. The copper plate has been set in an aquatint box in which he has generated a cloud of aquatint particles after the particles settle on the plate, it is carefully removed. The particles are set or fused through heat. Chris is using a heat gun from under the underside of the plate, and you can see the slight orange glow through the metal grate. Aquatint grain comes in different sizes from fine to coarse. When immersed in an acid bath, the acid bites into the plate around each particle. The ground is removed before printing. A newly formed network of lines holds the ink, creating a soft grain effect when printed. Aquatint produces tonal areas resembling a watercolor wash and is unlike etching or dry point and engraving where values are created through lines alone. Aquatint was first the first continuous tonal process in printmaking. Aquatint, however, cannot produce lines, so it is often used in conjunction with etching. As in etching, the longer the aquatinted plate is left in the acid bath, the deeper the bite. The aquatint sample on the right shows a grain-like pattern. Different levels of biting result in varying degrees of gray in the aquatint seen in the sample and in the tree lines landscape of Howard Heitzman's print, The Forest, on the left. When it comes to aquatint, Francisco Goya is masterful and it's difficult not to talk about him. He made his earliest explorations into printmaking in the 1770s. Late in his career at age 53, Goya embarked on his first major print series, series Los Caprichos, literally meaning caprices. However, his, his intention was to call the series dreams, which may relate to the Spanish literary tradition that uses the dream as a, as a device to satirize contemporary society, and often he incorporates fantastic creatures. Goya was gifted in translating his observations into visual commentary. He turned the spotlight onto human vices and corruption in Spanish society and the Catholic Church. Out Hunting for Teeth is a parody of people's superstitious beliefs. A woman who averts her gaze and protects her face pulls the teeth of a hanging man for the purported use in spells. They carried her off as a nightmare, nighttime scene where the dark background in aquatint is rendered with little detail, making it barren and indistinct. Goya layered aquatint and etched lines to give the shadows a greater richness. 
Goya often made subtle tonal gradations with the help of a burnishing tool that softens some of the pitted areas. The shadowed face contributes to the haunt haunting quality. A varnish can be applied to the aqua tinted ground to protect areas from the acid. This is known as stopping out, and these areas remain white. So Goya stopped out to create intense highlights um, that accentuate the sharp angle and the diagonal movement of the victim's body, adding more drama to the composition. While Goya combined etching and aqua tint, um, Pablo Picasso's print, Blind Minotaur leading, uh, being led through the night by a young girl, is done almost entirely in aqua tint. Aqua tint can look like a watercolor, but it can also be rich and velvety as seen here. The Minotaur was an alter ego for P Picasso. Its dual nature as part man, part beast alluded to the conflicting aspects of human nature. The young girl is likely his young mistress, Marie Therese Walter. Picasso worked from dark to light by first covering the entire plate with aqua tint. He used scraper and burnishing tools to gradually smooth areas, giving it a soft glowing highlight and creating a magical quality. And I don't want to give you the impression that all etching and aqua tint is in black and white. So here's um, a print by Katja Oxman. Um, the most straightforward approach to add color is to use a separate plate for each color of ink. But Oxman run, print runs, um, she really run the gamut of color. However, she typically uses three primary colors only, red, yellow, and blue. Additional colors in her palette, like purple, green, and orange, are from layering the primary colors. And hopefully you can sense the layering and the mixing of the colors um, in the orange areas and in the green areas where you start to see like the yellows peeking in, in between the reds. These secondary colors are mixed again to form grays and browns, giving her really an extensive palette. This is a work by Ello Griffith, who is often associated with Brown County. Rather than working on individual plates for each color, Griffith worked a la poupée by, by spreading ink on the surface of the plate with a rag on his fingertip. This method allows artists to use multiple colors on a single plate. However, if colors are placed too closely to one another, the inks overlap and smear. The downside may be that there isn't like a strict consistency between impressions and that it would be time consuming to ink each, each color for each, for each impression. However, for some artists, individual character in each print is important. Mary Nimmo Moran enjoyed working outdoors directly from nature like Corot. Our etching on Long Island is printed on silk rather than paper. The silk surface glistens and is warm in color. It's a beautiful impression. The ink is dark and rich, nearly standing in relief on the surface. Switching out her support and varying ink colors satisfied her curiosity and experimentation and provided subtle aesthetic choices between impressions. Printing on different supports lent a unique, one-of-a-kind sort of a cachet to her prints. She could then adjust her prices accordingly. Felix Buho is not a household name, but the Frenchman was an extraordinary experimental printmaker, active in the 1870s through the 1880s. In winter in Paris, Buho has combined etching and with dry points, velvety lines to give the snowy st street scene that diffuse quality so typical of a snow flurry. In the margins, additional drawings show the after effects of the snowstorm. A group of people warm their hands, horses are victims of the cold, and other people skate on the frozen sun. Buho's small drawings in the borders are common in his work. He referred to them as symphonic margins. This format may have been inspired by medieval manuscript illuminations use of borders for ornamentation or supplemental imagery related to the central image. Every time the artist makes significant changes to the plate and, and prints impressions, it is called a state. This print, also known as the cab stand, is by Buho and includes 14 states. His changes in compositional elements would allow him to sell the different impressions. Buho would also make variations in his ink color, how he wiped the, the plate and the type of paper. These choices made his impressions very individual, almost unique, 
which challenges our notion of the print as a multiple. Again, in the capstan, Buho focuses on weather conditions. The rain gives him an opportunity to focus on the overcast sky and the re reflections on the wet surfaces. In the previous two talks, I was able to share prints in the collection by Albrecht Durer, who revolutionized woodcut and engraving during the Renaissance. While there are some examples of his work that are done in etching, we unfortunately do not own an example. Instead, we will end this discussion of Intaglio looking at Warrington Colescott's humorous tribute to Durer. This is one of my favorite prints. It seems fitting as Colescott taught printmaking for years at University of Wisconsin-Madison, which continues to be renowned for its printmaking department. The artist is dressed in lederhosen for the studio visit. Durer's face is recognizable. The image is taken from the artist's painted self-portrait of 1498 at the Prado Museum. He has long brown curls, striped tassel cap that matches his, his open face duble. Like the painting, Durer is depicted in the same three-quarter view pose with clasped hands. Durer, Durer's serious demeanor as a worldly gentleman has morphed into a laugh. In the print, the artist sits at a table with a wood block and process and carving tools. His intaglio printing presses in the background. The artist's raucous apprentices all wear t-shirts emblazoned with the nested AD monogram, like members of a fan club or an example of good branding. Durer often places initials in clever locations in his compositions. So thank you for joining me today. My next print room talk is on Wednesday, March 15th at two o'clock. At that time, we will discuss the planographic process lithography.